Good morning. Um, welcome to the um, session P3A, which is the Research Data Management and Infrastructure session. My name is Stuart MacDonald from the Dina National Data Centre and um, the Univer Edinburgh University Data Library. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce three um, presentations showcasing um, institutional approaches to research data management, both um, services and in infrastructure. Um, today's session is of particular interest to, to me here, um, as here at Edinburgh I'm part of a group that's actually um, looking at research data support and building this around the, the research data policy that was passed by Senate here at, at Edinburgh in May of last year. Um, and I'd like to think that Edinburgh is sort of not far behind Oxford um, in our thinking in this area. And um, Sally will be talking in the second presentation this morning representing Oxford. <coughs> um, and also, uh, as we know, Australia's fairly well developed in, in their thinking in this area as well, both at a, an institutional level through um, Griffith and Monash and um, Melbourne, etc., but also at a, a national level through the Australia National Data Service. Um, just some sort of housekeeping. Um, we'll be having the, the, the Q&A uh, after each speaker. And if I could perhaps ask, um, when we do have um, questions, if we could wait until the mic arrives prior to asking the question, um, because the, the, the session is being recorded. Um, and if it, perhaps as well, if, if you could maybe give your, your name and your institution. Um, I'm going to hopefully give maybe sort of 20 minutes per presentation or so, plus uh, five minutes Q&A. And we'll try and sort of depart here slightly earlier so we can sort of beat the rush for, for lunch. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so our first speaker this morning is Natasha um, Simons. She's our Senior Project Manager in e-Research Services, um, Scholarly Information and Research at Griffith University. She manages a number of projects focused on building e-research infrastructure. And prior to this, she worked at the National Library of Australia for eight years in a variety of roles, including acting project manager of the Party Infrastructure Project funded by the, the Australian National Data Service and manager of uh, the Australia Research Online, an aggregator and discovery service for content in Australia, Australian repositories. She holds a Master of Applied Science, Library and Information Management, and a Bachelor of Arts, uh, Film and Media. And she's an active participant in CARES, the Australian University Repository Support Service. So I'll hand you over to Natasha. So my name is Natasha and I'm project manager at Griffith University. So I work in e-research <laughs> services, which is part of scholarly information and research at Griffith University. Um, and our area is uh, sort of a frontier area in the university that looks at um, research data infrastructure. So we deal with everything from data management plans to microscopy portals. And um, we've really grown in the last three years from a um, staff of about, about 11 staff in the area to today there's about 30. Um, and the area is largely project driven. Uh, so it was 35 hours door to door for me to get from Brisbane to Edinburgh and 10,137 miles. So suffering just slightly from jet lag. So hopefully I'm gonna remain co coherent uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, so I've been at Griffith for about a year, and before that I was at the National Library. Um, I wrote this talk in conjunction with um, Joanne Morris, who's the manager of e-research services at Griffith, but she's unfortunately not here today, so I'm giving her apologies. And she's actually um, the expert in the research hub, so uh, hopefully I'll reflect that work here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Griffith's data evolution journey, journey, and in terms of the conference themes, it fits in with the conference theme of open services for open content. 
So just an overview of what the presentation will cover. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Griffith University, um, give you an overview of the research hub so you actually know what I'm talking about at the start. Um, some of the drivers for developing the Griffith Research Hub, uh, the development architecture and result, and then a bit of a reflection on the benefits, the challenges, and some of the lessons that we've learnt along the way, and just a brief look at some of our future plans. So there's a little bit of the outcomes that will flow through from that, including just finishing on some of our projects through 2012 and 2013. Okay, so just a bit about Griffith University. So uh, Griffith was established in 1975. Um, so that's young. That's a young university, even by Australian standards. Um, there's 40,000 students from 124 countries, and five campuses that are spread across southeast Queensland from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. So if you look at the pictures, um, if you go clockwise from the top left, that's our South Bank campus, which has the College of Art and the Film School. So it's sort of an arts precinct. Um, and then there's a view from the Brisbane Eye, which is not quite as impressive as the London Eye, but we have an eye, that's something, never had one before. Uh, then there's a, the Griffith Film School, just on the right down there, it's a, an older building in Brisbane. Um, and then on the left is a picture I took at the Gold Coast, um, and I took that one because we have a campus on the Gold Coast, but I'm not actually sure that people really study go there to study. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of international students who come over with the intention of studying but spend a lot of time at the beach, I think. Um, so the ethos is cross-disciplinary research, sustainability and social inclusion. And uh, Griffith is a top 10 Australian research university and in 2011 appeared for the first time on the world's most prestigious university rankings, which is the academic ranking of world universities. And we have 40 uh, research centres. So what is the Griffith Research Hub? Uh, well, the hub was built by the Griffith eResearch Services team, um, Scholarly Information and Research. And in brief, the hub is a metadata store solution. And you may not be familiar with the term, but I'll talk about it as we go along. It's based on the open source Vivo software developed by Cornell University. And it ingests and aggregates data from a number of databases um, that are sources of truth at Griffith. It stores data, but it also stores the relationships between the data in an RDF triple store. It exports metadata records to the ANS Research Data Australia service, and I'll talk a little bit more about ANS if you're not familiar with them as I go along. And it was developed with funding from ANS, um, and we went a little bit further than the ANS funding and secured our own funding to develop the researcher profile system, which is what you see up there. Um, that's sort of the public visible face for one of the faces for the hub um, and that has profile pages showcasing Griffith researchers so it showcases their research activity their data collections and their and their research outputs so what were the drivers for developing the research hub well the data deluge and big data are terms that you're probably all familiar with and they're associated with the global push to manage these huge volumes of research data that have been generated worldwide uh, largely through improvements in technology. At the same time funding bodies are seeking a better return on their investments and uh, in Australia government reporting requirements link research outputs with funding. And there's also some national or government investment in managing research data and improving its accessibility. And in Australia, that's largely through the Australian funding of the Australian National Data Service. And at a local level, at Griffith, our, we have a strategic plan that uh, states the importance of Griffith as a world-class research institution and maps sort of the path we want to take in that area. And Anne's made funding available to Griffith to identify research data collections at the university. So this is where the e-research services team worked with individual researchers to get uh, collection descriptions of their research data and to actually get the data sets. Um, and building on that, we then got more funding to build a metadata aggregator, which is called the Research Hub, that could feed these records into the Research Data Australia web service. So if you haven't yet heard of ANS, the Australian National Data Service, um, they're funded by the Australian Federal Government. Um, their goal is to see more Australian researchers using research data more often. And they funded um, projects at pretty much all Australian universities to assist data management, data capture and data discovery. 
They have a online discovery portal that aggregates metadata about research data collections from Australian universities, and that's called Research Data Australia, and it's uh, publicly available to anybody. So the Metadata Exchange Hub project, well that started in 2010, and as I mentioned it was funded by ANS, and it was a joint project between <coughs> Griffith and the Queensland University of Technology, which is also in Brisbane, so very close to us, to develop a Metadata Exchange Hub. The project was funded under the ANS Metadata Stores program, which supports the development of institution-wide solutions for the discovery and reuse of research data collections. The project objective was to collect appropriate metadata from research collections within the university and, and, cust and provide customised feeds um, from various university content management syst systems. The hub then acts as a central university repository to feed information in a standard format uh, to the Australian Research Data Commons or the Re Research Data Australia service and also to university library discovery tools and to other discovery tools such as the National Library of Australia's Trove Service. So the overall objective was to develop a sustainable solution to automate the collation of new research data held within the university and to populate Research Data Australia. And formal collaboration on developing the metadata exchange was with uh, QUT, but we also had informal collaboration with other institutions around the ontology development, which grew up organically based on people, those institutions who had received uh, ANS funding to develop a metadata score, uh, regardless of the platform, uh, the software <laughs> platform that they had selected. So we selected Vivo, and I'm going to talk a bit more about Vivo uh, shortly. So first of all, where should we get this data? Where do we get information about data in the university? Um, we already had a research data repository, although it was very new. That's based on Equellus software. And that contains metadata that describes the research collections and it also contains the digital objects, so the actual data. Um, we also have Griffith Research Online, which is our publications repository, and that's a DSpace repository that has all the journal articles and conference papers and those kinds of things. We had a human resources system, um, which describes people and organisations, and we had a research administration database. I think you have a different type of name for it here, but that's, well, people have different names for it, but it contains information about research activity projects, projects that are funded and research, that kind of thing. And we also had a meta directory. And the most important thing in that um, was probably the meta directory, um, because that allowed us to get access, that contained data from some of those other systems and where we couldn't get into those systems because, for example, the HR system was private, we could get into the metadata, into the meta directory to get that information because it had been made public elsewhere. For example, you can't get into the HR system to, uh, to get some information about people, but it's available in the Griffith online phone book. So we went to the meta directory to get the information that was in the phone book. So we sort of skirted around some of the issues with private data sources in that way. Okay, I didn't want to do a death by diagram, so I've sort of just done a very simple one. Um, and if you look at the bottom, you'll see the, the data sources that are one direction. So they go from the data source into the hub. On the left, you have ANS persistent identifiers and National Library people identifiers. Um, so they're persistent identifiers for, for uh, people and organisations and we get them uh, from those sources and we also pull them back into the research hub. And on the top, that's the, where the research hub outputs, so it's sort of data in, data out. So up the top, um, the, the records go to Research Data Australia, the AN service, they go to library discovery tools and they go to other discovery tools such as the National Library's Trove service. Um, I do have more complex diagram, though I'm not, re I'm not the technical person, but if you want, I can provide uh, a better diagram with the RDF and the Sparkle queries and the OAIPMH and all that kind of stuff in it. Okay, um, so the data in the hub is stored in an RDF triple store, which fits nicely with the data format that ANS required Griffith to provide records in when we were providing records to Research Data Australia. And this format is called RIFCS, and it's based on the ISO 2146 standard 
and it has four different types of objects, which are collections, parties, activities, and services. And in the Research Data Australia context, these are objects used to describe research data and related entities. So a collection might be a data set or, or a collection about, of research data. A party is the researcher who created the collection. An activity is the project that funded that research. And a service is something a little different, such as an RSS feed. But the important thing to notice in this diagram is actually that it describes the relationships between the objects. And for Griffith, that type of information, the relationships between objects, didn't actually exist in any of our, the systems that we were drawing data from. So as I mentioned, the project, the hub uses Vivo software, which is a semantic web, triple store based approach to gathering and sharing research data. Vivo has been developed by a consortium in the US, which was originally Cornell. Um, and we selected it because it provided an administration and a user edit interface, a semantic web tool offering data storage in an RDF triple store, and, um, and also an, ont an ontology for describing research activity. And it was really that last point that stood Vivo apart from other similar options on the market. The Vivo ontology has been enhanced to support the ANS or CS requirements and enhancements, um, which are called the ANS Vitro ontology, were built as a community uh, initiative involving several Australian universities. And there's a link there if you want to see it. The ANS Vitro ontology is extensible and more detailed than RIF CS, and it can be applied to a wide variety of purposes. Some great benefits of the collaboration between institutions in developing the ontology were that we were able to split some of the work components, um, that the ontology is common to all of us, but each institution can extend it for their local purposes, and that we developed a community of strength. So this is the result. Uh, this is a snapshot from the ANS Research Data Australia service of one of the Griffith collections on southeast Queensland domestic water usage. Um, and we're also, one of our side, uh, our other projects at the moment is also funded by ANS, and it's a gold standard project to enhance this record and other records with as much, uh, basically to fill the RIF CS uh, schema to its full capacity so that we can make lots of linkages and things like that. Okay, so at Griffith we saw the value of the metadata store project and we secured funding to uh, develop the researcher profile system. And the vision for that is a showcase of Griffith research. It attracts potential HDR or higher degree research, got different acronyms here, um, students looking for a supervisor. It enables researchers to make connections from both within and outside of the university. And it's a one-stop shop for all things a Griffith research, which is projects, activities, collections, publications and researchers. So some of the benefits of the Hub project are that it's an international open source uh, solution with a community of users. The model is that you enter data once in the source system and you can uh, use it many times. It aggregates multiple authoritative sources of truth. It's automated. And importantly, it breaks down information silos within the university, which is what we have a lot of problem with. And we developed cross walks between multiple metadata standards. Um, it's semantic web which allows for richer data mining and improved discovery, has research profiles, and it contributes to the greater good because it's part of that Anne's mission about making data available for reuse. So some specific project challenges were that, you know, early implementers of Vivo means that you're a bit of a guinea pig and you've got to try things and see if they work. Um, Cross-institutional collaboration, Australia is very vast and so we had to do that collaboration over distances reaching agreement with various data, uh, data owners. And as I mentioned, we routed around some of the hard conver uh, conversations, if we could get in their data from the meta directory instead of from the source if it was private. Uh, getting support from st stakeholders, especially the Office for Research, because uh, we actually replaced their Griffith experts uh, system. Project board management is also an ongoing issue. Um, so ongoing challenges are the research data management and storage. Um, for example, we have issues of latency and timeliness, like when do you update and synchronise systems. And we also have an impact of a self-edit model. So because we exposed some data that hadn't been exposed 
before, some of it was found to be erroneous um, or, and people wanted to change that and we've allowed them to do that. Uh, so we have issues to do with that because they can edit some of the information in the hub and they don't have to change it in the source system and that's a bit of a problem in terms of um, the source system having one data and the hub having another data and um, that, that was actually a project board decision. Uh, so that's, that's how that went. Um, experience is a great teacher. Um, so some of the lessons learned, uh, that issue of exposure of data never made public before and aggregated into a discover layer. It's discovery layer, you know, researchers uh, have concerns about control over the data and of course they want to go in and correct it or have someone correct it on their behalf. And we had lots of questions around search results that you wouldn't normally get if you hadn't put that, all that information in one spot. So we had to do a bit of in project support and in-kind contributions and get support from the Office for Research, which was critical because they run the research administration database at the university. The next steps are that we took the RDF approach and we used it to model the raw underlying data. Um, so the actual data here, we're talking about not the metadata. And we did that through the Australian National Corpus uh, Project, which you can see a screenshot of which is about uh, linguistics, and that's a CMS um, driven by a triple store and an ontology. And we also have a repositories project at Griffith which will take the same approach to, and try to integrate with the hub so that we, we, ha we might have a storage layer like Fedora at the bottom, an RDF in the middle, and a CMS as the front end discovery. So just to finish, some exciting research data projects at Griffith uh, that we have the research hub phase two. Um, so this is exporting hub data for use by research groups, um, some visualisation of the data, um, expanding supervision to include theses of HDR students, um, improving links uh, to collections and methods for registering new collections. We have a second round of our metadata store so that we're looking at new ways of capturing uh, new collections at the university and integrating with the, with the National Library's party infrastructure. We have. Uh, uh, the other project of interest there, particularly to me, is the data citation project, because um, I'm a bit of a DOI evangelist at the moment, and um, just looking at how we move on from, because we've minted DOIs, at how to actually track them so that we can prove to researchers that they're of value and they're of value to the university. And I don't know that anyone's really got that um, in an automated way. If you do, please come and see me, because it seems like it's a really manual process, which is dreadful. Okay, so the obligatory side, acknowledging ANS as sponsors of the Metadata Hub project. And also, thank you. And I have actually some Research Hub postcards, postcards and stuff. If anyone wants it, I'm certainly not taking it back home with me, so come <laughs> and get me. <laughs> thank you. Many thanks, Natasha. <clears throat> we have um, a few minutes for um, questions. Um, as I mentioned before, if we could just give your name and affiliation. Um, and indeed, as I mentioned, we're also recording this, so if anyone does not want to be recorded, if you could please um, state and um, we, we will uh, record you. So any, any questions? Hi, Natasha. Simon Hodson from JISC. That was extremely interesting and very impressive. Um, two questions. The, the metadata uh, profile that you're using, the RIF CS, as yes. I understand it, how rich is that? And sort of as a follow-on question to that, um, do you have any, any evidence of the usefulness for it for data reuse and, and data discovery in those two separate functions, how well it's performing um, those, those functions for researchers who are looking for research data yeah. to reuse? Both very good questions. The first one, perhaps, uh, uh, I, I think it's it's it, it is a little bit uh, controversial, perhaps, in in some senses, um, because uh, Anne's got this funding and they had to do this uh, embark on the project straight away. So that is the schema they picked. So it didn't come organically from the community, and there's and then the community started using it because they got funding from Anne's projects, um, and so now they have an advisory group that can actually provide input into developing the schema and making it richer. It is actually fairly rich to start with, but it's, you know, it could do, you know, this with a lot of 
work, I think, um, but this is coming through from the community as we're going through this process, basically. Um, so what was, what was the other? It was, it was whether Griffiths and more broadly in Australia, I suppose, but particularly in oh, Griffiths the with the research hub. Yeah. Yes, you know, how, what, what the feedback and evidence is of reuse so far yeah. from researchers at Griffiths and elsewhere. Yeah, there hasn't actually been statistics collected from the Research Data Australia portal yet. And that's a really important point because that's really what we want to see. And that's what I was saying in terms of data citation that you, it's not good. You, you can't just give a DOI. You need to look at how it's used and whether it actually meets its purpose. And we, ha we haven't really got great statistics on how these things are being used yet. Unless, Anthony, you've got... We've been asking the same sort of questions, but we know from a researcher perspective, if you work in that particular domain, you will not go to Research Data Australia just for your researcher's <coughs> work and to reuse it. You'd probably more likely go to a portal that actually specialises in your researchers. It's more about cross-discipline uh, research, uh, we think, is, and that's the feedback we're getting from our researchers at Monash. One more question, yeah. Nancy Hopel Heinrich, Knowledge Motifs, LLC. I had a question about the persistent IDs that you're assigning. You, you just mentioned that you're assigning them to, to data objects, I believe, but I wanted to know if you could explain a little bit more about which ones you're using, whether you're using a standard, and, and how you're using them within your system. Yep, uh, we use a few, actually. So Vivo has its own, and we use those to mint um, ANS persistent identifiers, so they have a persistent identification minting service where we can mint them and that becomes a RIF CS. In RIF CS that's called a key and that's the unique identifier for that object within RIF CS and within ANS. But we also support other persistent identifiers. So the National Library has got a party <laughs> identification system like basically ORCID but at a national level um, and managed by a public government body, um, so one persistent identifier for each unique researcher in Australia. Um, so we use those and we're also just, we have handles in our reposit in our DSpace repository of course. Um, and also uh, we're just starting to look, well we've minted DOIs for all our collection records but we're looking at how to, how to track their usage in citations and those kinds of things. One last question. Yep. Hi, um, Alan Sutlow from the British Library. It's a related question about citation and rewards um, in terms of um, once you can start to cite data sets, you've got the infrastructure to do it, then obviously there's an opportunity then to try and get them in the, at the same level as you might publications. From the sort of interviews and, and background knowledge I have around uh, the uh, re research evaluation ec excellence framework in the UK and other reporting systems. People are, at the moment are being risk averse. They're basically just thinking about publications as their returns under that evaluation framework. What's the feeling in Australia about other types of research outputs, particularly data sets in that regard? In terms of citing? In terms of returning as an evaluation measure yeah. for yeah. research funding in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, it's really in its infancy, I think. So... Yeah, it's it's all it's not it's really happened at the level of journal articles and research outputs so far. But I think we've done a good good made a big start in terms of managing the research data, but yeah, in terms of tracking usage and citations, that's a little further down the track and one of the projects we're about to do at Griffith is to work with researchers to 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 cite their data sets within the publication and we'll, we'll be tracking the statistics from there. So, but as I said, that's actually a quite, as far as I can tell, that's going to be a very manual process managed by a librarian. And I know, um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how to automate that or streamline that. And maybe Google Analytics has some answers there, but that's what we'll get to when we go through the project. Many thanks. And um, thanks, Natasha. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Sally Rumsey from the University of Oxford. 
Um, Sally's a digital collection development manager at the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford. She leads the, the group responsible for, for development of and outreach for the Bodleian Library's internal born digital and digitised collections. She manages the Oxford University Research Archive Publications Repository and is involved in developing and implementing services to support Oxford's emerging research data management infrastructure. Thanks, Sally. Good morning. I'm going to give you an overview of what's going on at Oxford with um, regards to setting up um, this whole infrastructure for data management. It's a huge task, and I think one thing which has come out of this is how collaborative across the institution this has to be. It's not just the Bodleian libraries which are picking up this job. It runs across the computing services and also research services, and we need a lot of buy-in from other places as well across the university. So first of all, to think about this need for data repositories, it seems to have come in a very different way to um, the publication repositories, which were very library-driven. The data repositories, I mean, we've all been talking about it for quite some time within the repository community, but really it seemed to take one letter from EPSRC, which has made the vice chancellors in the UK really sit up and take note that something needs to be done about research data management. Now, at Oxford, we had quite a few projects sort of underway, some of them funded by the GISC and some from UMF sources as well. And um, so what we decided to do with this particular GISC-funded project is try to glue together the bits that were already underway and add a few more bits and pieces to try and create this core infrastructure for managing research data across the university. And I've listed some of the drivers there that, um, that give us the need for data repositories. But I think, as I say, the, the, the immediate driver now, which We'd already started on the, um, the data management rollout at Oxford project, the Damero project, but the, this EPSRC requirement has really focused minds, and it's been quite good to be able to go to senior management and say, well, actually, we are beginning to do this so we can fit in with the roadmap that the EPSRC is, is requiring. And we're seeing the EPSRC um, plans as, as the beginning and expect other research funders to follow. One thing which I should say, which is very important at Oxford, is we hear a lot of talk about uh, research funders driving this through, but in fact we have an awful lot of unfunded research at the university which presents its own problems for how we're going to deal with that data and what are the requirements and so on. Now, the Damero project has these four major strands which we think pretty well cover most of the things that we need to think about in research data management. The research data management policies, as, as part of the project, we need to come out the other end with a, a university policy, and this is where Edinburgh is actually ahead of us, because they've got one. We've got one which is um, in discussion. It keeps going around various committees um, and getting sort of tweaked and changed. Um, we, we will have one before too long, but it's proved quite difficult to get something which um, the academics felt was actually supported underneath. So that's coming, and once we've got the top level policy, we will then be able to hang off the other policies that we need underneath that policy. So for instance, a policy for each of these services that we'll be running. The training support and guidance, another soft area of the project, very important, and we need to train not only students and research staff, but we need to train support staff 
for example, the subject librarians. There's been quite a few um, publications come out recently about reskilling subject librarians for research data management. And I think you know everybody's got quite a big job on their hands to make sure that everybody who needs to know does know what's going on, what's possible, and can act as that bridge between the academic departments and the service departments. Um, we're doing some work with the University of Southampton there. We've just joined up because they're doing similar work, so we decided it would be a good idea to uh, share notes and resources there. The third strand, the technical strand, is sort of where the Bodleian libraries come in. We'll be providing some of the services, the technical services, to support the research data infrastructure. And I'll be talking about those a bit more in a moment. And finally, and this is the big one which always comes up, who's going to pay for it in the end? You know, it's all very well. We've got this, this lovely funding to get us going now, but come um, the end of the project, what are we going to do there? Who's actually going to pay for the services and systems? And each of those strands has got a named lead whose responsibility it is to see it through to its end by the end of the project. Now, this, this is death by diagram, I think, so I apologize for that. But hopefully, um, with a bit of an explanation, it sort of it encapsulates the whole of the Damero project. Across the top, I don't know if my little squeaker, oh, there we go. Across the top, we've got these four strands of policies, training, and sustainability, which run right across the whole of the project. And here, we've got another JISC-funded project, the Oxford DMP Online project which is running parallel to our Damero project, and they're setting up a data management planning service for the university. Underneath there, we've got what we're doing in the Bodleian, really. And I've split that into three areas. We've got the data creation part of the research data management, where we've got um, local data stores for live um, data creation and when researchers are sort of um, still working on their data. So we've got Data Stage there, which was another funded project and has produced um, a local store that people can use, for example, in their departments or research institutes. We've also got the VIDAS project, which is producing a, a database as a service project. So that's where the research is being created. Once it's been created, it can then be archived. And this is the archival data store that we're building in um, Bodleian libraries. Now, um, you may be familiar with the term data bank um, out of the uh, data flow project. Too many data words here, I know, but um, <laughs> if you can just try and keep up. Um, data bank was originally um, built in the Bodleian libraries. Ben Osteen, who was here um, when he was working on our um, on our repository, we set up this, this data repository quite some years ago, and it's been picked up by the Dataflow project and created into something really nice. So we're implementing Data Bank, or continuing to imp implement Data Bank as the archival data store within the Bodleian libraries for the university. Um, you'll also notice underneath there, we're building a little software store. Um, work in progress, haven't got that one resolved yet, but that, that's going to be another part of our data storage. And then finally, over here, you've got the dissemination. And we're calling our, our research data catalog Data Finder. Hopefully, that's easy to remember for our academics. And the idea being that we can store metadata in there about research data wherever it happens to live. It doesn't matter whether it's in data bank or it's somewhere else. And that's being seen as the hub, really, of the whole data infrastructure for the University of Oxford. Data Finder will hold the metadata, and it can um, relate to items in the institutional publications repository and vice versa. And then underneath here, we've got the external environment. Um, there will be external data stores which can feed our Data Finder. Um, data Finder works on a hierarchical model, so we, we can have a university one, we can have departmental ones underneath, we could have a, a Data Finder somewhere else in another institution or a regional one or something, and they can all feed each other. And finally, we've got Colwiz there. I don't know if you're familiar with Colwiz. It's, it's a bit of free software for um, collaborations between researchers. Um, it was developed at the University of Oxford, very nice little bit of kit, and um, we're going to be using Colwiz as um, a feed for data bank and vice versa, so you can surface um, data, uh, data sets in Colwiz as part of your library there. 
So our data bank fits into a series of federated repositories. It's not the only repository. Um, we know that researchers put data elsewhere. And so it has to fit into this whole picture of data repositories, some of which you'll be familiar with there. Uh, there are more, I know. Thinking then about Data Finder, it's this catalogue of data. So it only holds metadata for the data sets that are produced by Oxford <coughs> Academics. And we're using this as a sort of audit, I suppose, of what we got, what we've got, but also as a discovery tool so that people both internally and externally can find what we've got as, to, uh, as far as data sets goes. And it's built on a sort of um, on a model of data, find, of data bank so that the two are completely compatible. They're sort of one and the same. So it's using the same technologies as we're using for data bank. And <coughs> the idea is that um, metadata can be imported in from any, any other um, source that we want to. Mm -hmm. And also, we can export uh, data from it. Um, we'll be using OAI PMH, we hope, as the main uh, conduit. Mm -hmm. And um, also RDF uh, um, metadata as well. It's metadata agnost agnostic. We know it has to be because we're getting all sorts of metadata. I mean, the standards out there, there are just so many. We need to be able to import whatever we're given, really. So we're looking very much cross-disciplinary, and we're not being picky about the metadata that's coming in. And I thought I ought to throw this in. Please don't ask me too many uh, technical questions about this. But this was drawn by my colleague, Neil Jeffries, and it shows how data bank works. Basically, uh, sorry, data finder works. Data finder lives in the middle. Um, on the right hand side, you've got sources wh where metadata is harvested from coming into data finder. The um, services on the bottom left hand corner there, the repository Colwiz and the Oxford DMP online, they will have a two way conduit to data finder so they can both feed data finder and data can be fed back to them. That's different to the harvested sources on the right. We're not looking to push back data into the harvested sources. So when we're thinking on the left-hand side about an edit service into Data Finder, records can be edited in Data Finder, but the edits won't be pushed back to the source. What we're going to be saying is that if somebody wants to edit um, something from a source such as um, the social sciences have got their own um, uh, uh, database for research information, that we will direct people to the source to do the editing there, if at all possible. And finally, at the top there, we've got um, records which be can be created manually and pushed in, um, in Data Finder. And we will also have um, a data reporter, which is going to be pushing out stats and business intelligence information. I should also say that Data Finder is going to be the home of metadata about um, offline data. Um, we can have you know, bits of paper in the bottom of filing cabinets. We could even have specimens in jars, which could also class as data. So we need to be able to hold records for those as well. So populating Data Finder, we've got three sources of information, really. We've got manual entry which may well form part of, of the um, <clears throat> metadata collection. Hopefully, we can import existing metadata. It's not quite the same as it is with publications where you've got lots of sources of metadata. We will get it from where we can. And we will also hopefully be able to get some um, metadata automatically generated um, by pulling in data from other systems and being clever about it. We will see how that goes. To manage all of this, we're trying to think of a minimum metadata set. Now, this, this creates quite a lot of problems. What we want is to recommend to the university a small set of metadata which we say, look, we recommend that at a bare minimum you have this metadata about your data set. And we're trying to make it as small as possible because researchers basically don't like creating metadata. And also, when we're thinking cross-disciplinary, we need to make sure that whatever we choose will work for any discipline. 
Now that's all well and good having that minimal set, but then sometimes, for example, if you're funded by one of the major funders, you need to include some, some other metadata which the funder then says you must include, such as the name of the funder and the grant number. So we need, therefore, to think about a sort of contextual metadata set. So if you're funded by X, you need to provide A, B, and C metadata. Then finally, there's everything else. There is the optional metadata, which could be pretty well anything. This is very, very much work in progress, and this is where we're standing at the moment with our minimal metadata set. We've started with um, the minimum set from the data site people who've got their kernel of five elements there, which are pretty easy, we think, to be able to get hold of for most in most cases. Now, for Data Finder, one of the key things for Data Finder is where the data lives. So we need some form of location. Now, that location might be a URL, which you can just click on, and bingo, you go straight into the data. However, it might equally be the contact details of the data owner for data which is embargoed, or there are other reasons why it's not immediately made available. In addition to that, there are other things like access terms and conditions, which we think ought to be associated with every single data set that we've got. And um, coming <coughs> down the list to the data owner, I've got rather a lot of icons on there, but um, coming down the list there, um, the data owner and embargo date, um, the, the date of access to the data are important things which we think ser people searching for data will want to know. So this is our starting point. We've got it down to 12 fields. We will see how it goes. We've got a lot of work to do with, um, with, with our um, testers to find out how this works and what we can actually import from existing data services and how it will fit with, with our minimum metadata set. So n not perfect, I'm sure. It's worth stressing that this project is not going to be a cure-all for the University of Oxford. By the end of the project, at the end of March next year, we're not going to be able to say, fantastic, we've got it sorted, we know exactly what we're doing with data management at Oxford. <coughs> it's going to be a foundation stone for the research data management for the university, and we have to take this long view. We have to say, okay, we will have got here by next March, but there is still a lot of work to do on all the systems, on all the training, on all the aspects of the project. But what we want by the end of March is something that's working and we can see what the next steps are that we have to take and hopefully where the money is coming from. And finally, this is what we're looking at. We're not looking at something which is perfect. It has to be good enough for that point in time, so that then that we can go on and continue to extend and develop and to train people and to, um, to, to extend the knowledge. And hopefully, by the end of March, no pressure, we will have two services in the library, Data Bank and Data Finder, which will at least form a major part of the data management for Oxford. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sally, for a very interesting overview. Um, we have time for um, some questions. Uh, John McCaffrey, University of Dundee. Uh, I noticed in the, the, the minimum metadata set that you didn't have format. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you didn't have format? <laughs> Yes. What we're hoping to do, and this is all hoping, is that um, we'll be able to pick that up. Certainly from data bank, it will be automatically um, picked up, like the size of the file. We're hoping that some of our systems can pick that up. Um, yes, we could ask for it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that we do need for preservation purposes, certainly. But um, we're hoping to be able to gather some of that in other ways, hopefully, from where things are coming from. I'm sure there are other fields that everyone will say, ah, but yes, you need, you need this as well. There's one question up the top there. Yep. 
So I've played a bit with the code for data bank and for data stage, but I hadn't seen code for data finder and I was just Googling around and, and uh, found some on GitHub, but it looks like it's just been up for a couple of days. So I'm wondering before I spend too much time digging through it, uh, what's the status of that? Very new. Very new. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope by the autumn that we'll have something that we can, we can really show you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We have a question down here. And Um, I guess your strategy is to make the barrier to engaging with you as low as possible yeah. so that you can amass as much data as possible. Um, did you weigh up the pros and cons of making it more difficult for the researchers to um, ingest the data with you by asking for more metadata, but the advantages then of being able to do more with the data and better visualizations and searches and things? How did you balance those two arguments? It's really going from um, our experience with the institutional repository, where we know that people manually don't like um, adding lots of metadata. We will encourage them to add a lot more. And of course, when you're looking cross-disciplinary, you have to be very careful what you do actually mandate, because um, you know, it just doesn't work across the disciplines if you're looking at lo lots of the fields there. And also, we know that a lot of researchers already use very comprehensive uh, metadata schema. I mean, social sciences have got their DDI metadata scheme, which is, is vast. And if they can provide us with lots of that, then fantastic. This is going to have to come into um, the training and guidelines. I mean, obviously, we would love rich metadata. But I think we have to start with low barriers um, to begin with. We will be doing lots of testing with real people, and we will see how this goes. So by the end of the project, we've got a much more realistic view of what people are prepared to do. I have a, a quick question, Sally. Um, it's the dreaded sustainability question. Um, it's just whether, indeed, you envisage, um, or if you're able to, to divulge, whether any of the costs would be passed on to researchers. I think that's... Um, it's inevitable in the form of um, applying for funding. You know, you need it to go align in the funding application when research is funded, and that comes into the training, um, which I think a number of people have mentioned. We need to get in with the, met with the researchers at a very, very early stage so that they know to put that line in for sustainability. We need to come up with some clear costs so they know how much to put in to their, uh, the line in their project. But as I mentioned, we've got a lot of unfunded research at the university, so somehow that has to be paid for. And um, I would have brought along my crystal ball, but I, you know, I've left it at home. I, you know, I don't know how this is all going to be funded in the end, and this is being thrashed out at Oxford, as I expect it is in most institutions, actually. Many thanks, Sally. Thanks. Thank you. Morning is um, Anthony Beats. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, he's a manager of Monash's um, e research centre. He has extensive experience in the selection, development, and deployment and support of e research software infrastructure, especially in research data management. He directs the development and deployment of research data management infrastructure at Monash and, and has co authored Monash's research data management strategy. Before joining the Monash e Research Centre in 2008, he was a project manager for the DART and Archer projects, um, two key Australian e research initiatives which explored and developed infrastructure for research data management. 
And prior to his appointment at Monash in 2006, he'd over a decade of experience in research and development with Telstra, which is um, Australia's major telco. So I'll hand you over to Anthony. Thanks, Stuart. I'll start by today with this particular comic. And uh, I think it's quite relevant to the field that we're in. Uh, we know that with researchers, they spend a lot of their time around data, um, capturing it, analysing it, writing up about it. At the end of the day, there's not much to sort of show for it. Um, Monash has been working in research data management for more than six years now. We've uh, gained a lot of insight into research data management, uh, especially in the infrastructure side. So what I'm hoping to tell you about today is uh, give you some insights in the selection, uh, development, deployment, and also the support of research data management infrastructure. Now, um, at this conference, we've already spoke about a lot of this already, so I'm not going to spend too much time in this slide. But we know that with researchers, why research data management is becoming important. We know there's that onslaught of data. How do they manage it? They've got instruments that the, the data is being born digital. Um, there's a lot of it. How do they basically um, access it, share it with others, etc.? We also know that there's particular um, policies that they now have to stick by. Codes like uh, around the world, there's particular research codes about research data management uh, associated with it. Also, legal obligations as well. We know that researchers get grants. Um, they may have clinical data. And how that data is handled is very important. I think you'd be surprised at how many universities at the moment, um, because of how they're actually um, working with that data, are actually exposed legally. So uh, it's a very important one for the researchers as well. The other thing is that we're finding that with the access to so much data now, uh, with reuse potentially, there's going to be things that we've never seen before. So our researchers will come up with new research outcomes. It'll also enhance their research practices. The ways that they worked in the past are going to change. So why is an institution uh, um, really interested in research data? Obviously, it's different from the researchers. And for research institutions, they want to pro provide world-class infrastructure to attract the best researchers. They, they want um, to um, get that additional funding by having higher impact, uh, more research outcomes. And research data is a vehicle to actually achieving that. Also, uh, I mentioned before about the legal risk aspect. Um, the universities all are very aware of this at the moment, and they're now very much sort of hurrying, uh, I know my university has been, to actually sort of close that particular gap. And I'll talk a bit about that in the infrastructure side. So how about the researchers? Um, what are they like? It's a good you know, time to actually look at you know, what exactly is a researcher about. Many of us sort of work in the libraries or the IT space, and we really don't understand what the research psyche is. Uh, and the researchers are very much focused on actually research outcomes. Um, they work in, in an interpretive mode. Um, you know, it's very iterative in its process, um, very ambiguous uh, space. Um, and uh, also, it's very open-ended. And by that, you know, um, in contrast to our IT support, etc., it's very analytical. Um, they like to get something started and off their um, books as soon as possible. And they don't like chaos um, where the researchers uh, live. They like to sort of understand it uh, and try and reduce those particular bits of risk. Uh, the other thing about the, the researchers is that we know that when they start a grant, they're given money towards a particular thing. By the end of the particular grant, what they could be doing is completely different. The other thing is they're very responsive to what's actually happening out there in the research space. So they might be changing what they're doing based on that. Um, also, we know with researchers is that they're very loyal to their research community, more so than their institution. And this is a very important thing when you're actually deploying infrastructure for researchers. Also, um, they may require um, ICT capabilities over a very short period uh, of time. You know, they're, they're doing research, they've got a research outcome they're working towards. They only want this IT infrastructure for that very short period, and after that, they don't care what happens to it. They're also very resourceful and driven, and so if some group provides a barrier, they'll find ways around it, and they'll do it themselves, even if they don't have the skills in it. Talking about IT service divisions at universities as well that actually support the researchers, you know, very different sort of a landscape there. Very broad in their service base. They're looking at administration, uh, education, and research. And each of those fields are very different. Uh, administration, people are getting paid to do a particular job. Most of the systems are relatively straightforward. They get lots of training in it. 
research, there's many different researchers. As I said, there's many different communities and stuff like that, very many different cultures. Um, and providing a solution in that space becomes quite interesting. Also, uh, traditional IT groups, they excel at selecting a solution, deploying it, supporting it for an institutional, uh, on an institutional sort of enterprise-wide base. A lot of researchers don't want an enterprise solution necessarily. Sometimes they just want a small solution, as I said, for meeting their short-term needs. Uh, I mentioned before about the interpretive mode that researchers work in. Well, the, the IT group works in an analytical mode, so there's a contrast between those two different groups. And also, the IT groups are very much involved in trying to keep their IT services up as much as possible. That's a priority for them. Now, this graph actually scares the, the dickens out of the, research, uh, the IT um, support community. They know that the data is growing at an exponential rate. And they know that the budgets is only getting a little, bit, uh, um, a, a little bit larger. So how do they sort of keep up in that space? So that's another thing in the, the minds of uh, IT groups at institutions. Now, I know that um, research isn't a, a linear sort of uh, uh, workflow. This is a very simplistic one. I'm using it to sort of try and explain how some of the uh, infrastructure actually fits into research data management uh, for researchers and that. Uh, initially, uh, you know, someone will conceive an idea. They'll go and design some experiments around it. Uh, they'll actually go and uh, analyze what they've actually gone and collected. They'll then you know, start looking at it and say, oh, this looks a bit interesting. I might go and talk to my colleague at another university or maybe at another lab around the university. So they start collaborating. Also, um, and then once they're finished and they've written it up, they then want to publish it and make it available somewhere. But you don't want to just make it available anywhere. Sometimes you really want to target it to particular communities. Because if you send it anywhere, well, how are people going to find it? If you're in a particular discipline, you're very much going to try and target your particular community's portals and that. So how um, research data management fits into this. So data management planning at the design stage, thinking about what you're actually going to do. Uh, Monash has got a very different approach to, to data management planning. We actually think about what are the outputs and then sort of work backwards. Um, but that's another talk. Um, also, that, that middle stage, it's more about having some sort of a, a platform for researchers to do these things, to facilitate that sharing, et cetera, that, that access uh, to their data and making it available to a publication. And finally, the exposure. Where do, you ex where do you pass it out to? And it could be uh, an institutional repository. It could be a national repository. Uh, it could be uh, an electronic journal somewhere. Uh, or it could be some particular community portal that th that particular research community has started up. Now, um, people are, keep asking me, well, what's it like in research data management space? You know, Monash has been working there in the last six years. You know, is it sort of a, a done deal? And I'd say no. And looking around and talking to others, it's, it's at a very early stage. This is actually Manhattan Island. Um, but it's trying to demonstrate that, you know, um, get across to you that we're at a very early stage with research data management. Researchers um, are just becoming aware of it, um, becoming aware of their obligations. They don't have much infrastructure in this space. And it's our responsibility to help them with that. So um, many researchers at many institutions, it's still this sort of you know, um, way of working. They've actually got you know, USB sticks, portable hard drives, et cetera, um, CDs. Uh, and each of these has got particular problems. It's also these particular mechanisms aren't very good for um, reliability uh, or, or sharing with other researchers and that. We really want to sort of change this particular space. So I'll first start on selecting a particular um, research data management platform. Uh, now, we know that researchers have different workflows. Um, they uh, have got different environments in that. Uh, and also, they've got very much different instruments and stuff like that. And so trying to provide one single research data management solution for all researchers at an institution, it's just not going to work. And if you've ever tried it, you'll find that there, will be, there won't many, be many researchers that will actually engage with it. Also, as I mentioned before, the cultural aspect is very important. They've got those stronger synergies with people outside of the university rather than inside the university. Um, they're more likely to use their, inst uh, their community solution rather than the institutional solution. As I mentioned before, research uh, IT groups at universities are good at providing enterprise solutions, not for customized fit solutions for particular researchers. It's a very different space, very different mindset. Also, um, if we have to start looking at, uh, OK, we may have to support a number of different solutions for different disciplines across a university, 
you know, how do we go about it? And now we know that if we start developing new products um, for each of the different disciplines, if I at Monash did it for every different community at Monash, there's no way that I have enough money to do it. That's not supportable. Um, so I really don't want to develop a new solution. I want to, leave, uh, uh, I want to really only do that as a last resort if there's nothing in that particular space. So what I think about first is working with the community. And when I'm selecting a solution, I'll talk to a researcher. Does a solution already exist in that particular space? Do my researchers want to engage with that particular solution? So I actually adopt a solution at my university first above actually developing anything new. If I develop something new, I'm going to break the collaboration cycle. So imagine you've got some researchers. Um, they've asked you to provide a solution. Their community already uses some solution. And I tell them to go and use the institutional solution. That's not a good way for them to collaborate with their, their colleagues outside. Or I go, OK, um, I'm just going to go and develop a brand new solution. Once again, I've broken that, um, that uh, collaboration cycle with their colleagues outside, which is a very important thing for researchers. I'm better off understanding what their needs are and actually embracing the community solution and engaging with it. It's also important from a sustainability uh, viewpoint, too, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, many people will probably say, well, why have I jumped to deployment? And uh, it's, it's sort of what I sort of suggested in the previous slide. Talk to the researchers, understand what their needs are, select a solution, and if you can, deploy it. Don't go into development. Development should be a last resort. So if I am going to deploy a solution, um, I know inside of um, what I deploy at Monash is going to be different from what other people deploy at other universities. And the reasons, there's obvious reasons for that. Um, there's different data management policies, um, different um, you know, ways you can basically deploy it. You could deploy it at the institution level, or you can deploy it on the department level, the, the faculty level, the, the um, institution level, the national level, and, and uh, also in the cloud. And each of those have got their own pros and cons. And they all sort of depend on the factors underneath, um, the ethical considerations and the legal considerations. I know that with clinical data, I must store it in a Monash research data store. I cannot put it anywhere else. The cloud just does not um, provide a solution for me in that space. Um, or I may not have the capabilities to go and deploy a particular solution. So it might be more attractive for me as an institution to support my researchers to see if that solution can be provided either by my state, which is state, county, province, et cetera, for, for some of you, or, or by uh, a national solution. Um, that might be a much better way of doing it. The other thing is the cloud offers researchers the capability of deploying it themselves for their own community. They no longer need to rely necessarily on IT groups to do it. Or there might be a solution that they can pay for that already exists in the cloud. So there might be options there. So there's many different um, things to consider. And it will be different for every university and different uh, applications as well. So that comes to my the point there that uh, as an institution, you must be flexible in how you deploy this particular infrastructure. So sort of coming, taking a step back and saying, what sort of infrastructure is, is a part of all of this? And I mentioned before about the research data management platform. So that was to help them capture the data to, or to actually um, uh, organize the data, uh, share with others, and to publish. There's also the, the capturer components. And the capturing could come from many different areas. Um, people think, oh, I'm capturing data. Oh, I'm, it comes from an instrument. Well, it could come from compute as well. So I've gotten some data. I've stored it already in my research data management platform. I've gone and analyzed it in some com a high performance computing system. I need to recapture it back into my system. So that's that derived data. So I need to support that as well. When I think about research data management, it's, it's uh, a platform. It's really supporting it all the way from capture all the way through to publication. Um, the reason why I don't think of it as just that end bit, we know from our own experiences at Monash, if we do research data management where we try and curate something right before someone publishes, it's a lot of work for the researcher. The researcher hates doing metadata. They hate having to choose what they keep and what they get rid of. They hate having to choose what they archive, etc. Trying to get them to actually uh, curate something just before the end for publication, you really need a big stick to actually make them do it. And that's not the way. You're better off trying to work it in with their current workflows. So um, compute is another aspect. And of course, of course the batch deposit. Um, someone's gone and taken it from some other system, and they'd like to move it across to this particular platform. Or they've got a whole lot of data that captures elsewhere, and they'd just like to move it in. It's a very manual process. The storage infrastructure, uh, many groups. Uh, I've sort of divided it like this because uh, of, of what I've seen around the place. Um, 
you must have, for the research data management platform, that's great, but you must have some storage infrastructure as well for it to rely on. And it has to be secure and reliable. If you've got, um, if you don't have strong foundations, how can you provide strong solutions at the top for research data management platform? Uh, at Monash, we've got a large petabyte da data store. So all of our research data management platforms basically sit on that solid foundation. Uh, some groups also think about long-term vaults, and, and you know that could be locally or it could be somewhere else as well. And once again, it depends on the solution. If you're actually looking at uh, clinical data where it has to be stored uh, at your institution, then your long-term vault has to be local to your institution. Supporting infrastructure for all of this, and um, once again, many of these things you're actually quite familiar with. And you can sort of see here that uh, uh, you know, um, when you actually make data available, you probably want to describe it. And uh, Natasha mentioned it in Australia, it's important for us to describe that data by its activities and its parties. So parties being the researcher. So it's important for us to be able to sort of uh, link in to the researcher information uh, at our university uh, and provide that to actually enrich in the research data uh, collections that are available. Same for the grant information, um, once again. But some of that information might come from outside, because if I actually do uh, uh, I might want to make a particular collection available, I might have researchers from outside of my institution. So I need to think about systems that I also key into that are outside of my university. Same for the grants. I've got funding bodies. They're the best source of information, uh, of the source for this particular sort of information. I need to be able to key into those as well. Identifier services. Um, we mentioned, uh, they've been mentioned quite a bit, DOIs in particular. Uh, and, and also handle. Some groups say it's too expensive to mint everything with a DOI, so we also need to support that with other things. We use both handles and DOIs at Monash. Uh, authentication services. Um, for us, um, when we provide a, a solution, we try and reduce the barriers to it. And by that, uh, at the moment, for many solutions, we're providing access uh, through our own local authentication system. So for them, they don't have to go and register somewhere else, they can go and access it directly or either that or via shibboleth um, for federated uh, security. With all of these systems, you don't want your researchers to have trouble accessing it. You really want to reduce the barriers to accessing it if you want to encourage them to adopt them. And of course, the uh, citation services, which has also been mentioned quite a lot uh, in this particular conference. When you've gone and got all this data, you then want to make it available to different groups. And I mentioned a lot of this particular uh, before that it could be a, a national directory collection, it could be uh, an institutional collection, uh, it could be a community portal, or it could be an electronic journal. Depends on what the researcher basically wants to do. Um, many of you are probably surprised to, if, if, for me to tell you that Monash doesn't have an institutional data collection. Um, many of my colleagues, uh, my, many of the other universities around Australia do have it. Um, Monash doesn't feel like it's one of our priority areas at the moment. What we're finding is that with researchers, they need help at the coalface. Providing these institutional pushes and extra levels of bureaucracy aren't necessarily going to help them. The other thing about an institutional repository is we're sort of trying to work out what the benefits are. We know that there's a national data collection. It's got a lot of information there. It also gives a much broader view. Wouldn't you rather go to that than an actual institutional repository? So for us, we just don't quite see the point in doing that sort of thing at the moment, so we're very much um, having, uh, taking a, 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 just waiting and see what happens in that space. Also for data management planning, um, we've done a lot of work in this space already. We started with the data management plan. Um, we've now got a checklist. Um, we're thinking of actually reducing that even more. When we do stuff at Monash, we think about what's the purpose for what we're doing. Um, we don't build infrastructure for the sake of building infrastructure. We don't deploy infrastructure for the sake of deploying it. We sort of try and work out, well, what's it actually for? And with data management planning, we're not quite sure about what we need to do there yet. So we know about data management planning on, online, DMP online, but once again, you know, we really want to see what the right plan is for us, or the checklist is for us, before we actually go and automate that or deploy a system. Now, um, what's happening, uh, so that sort of gave you a feel for it, and this is actually an instance of, of that infrastructure in practice. And uh, so what happened uh, about three years ago was um, our, our protein crystallographers, the Australian synchrotron is, is on your left. Uh, it's just across the road from us at Monash. And what our, our researchers would do was they'd actually conduct an experiment. They'd um, go to the synchrotron. They'd have a portable hard drive. They'd put the data on that. And then they'd come back to Monash. 
and um, it wasn't shared easily with their colleagues and that they didn't put it anywhere that was shareable, etc. Um, sometimes it'd sit on the shelf for a few months and our synchrotron only keeps its data for about two years. And then they go to the, the, the portable hard drive and they'd realise that um, it's corrupt because they've written so many times to it. And they've, they'd then go back to the synchrotron and, sorry, the data's been deleted. So they'd have to redo the whole experiment again. And for these researchers that are trying to get the perfect crystals and scheduling time on the synchrotron and that, it's not exactly what they wanted to hear. So um, now the synchrotron did provide a portal in where researchers could go and actually pull their data. Um, but researchers never went and used it. You know, they didn't, didn't understand it. It didn't make it easily accessible for them, potentially, or shareable with others, etc. So they never used that particular service. So we took some of our own infrastructure for protein crystallography that we've got at Monash, and we made it available for, for the researchers uh, at the Synchrotron. And uh, what it does now is it automatically, once the experiment has been completed, metadata is stripped out. Um, the data still st is stored in the uh, Synchrotron's data store. And then it looks at the researcher associated with that particular uh, experiment. And if it belongs to a researcher that actually has one of these repositories at their institution, it automatically ships the data to that institution. And then the researchers access it via their own lo local authentication. And there's been a huge pickup in Australia, oh, at Monash in this particular space, but not just in Monash, all around Victoria, the state that I'm from, and actually all around Australia. Many universities now are either thinking about this or actually have access to this at the moment. And it's been applied not just for prote uh, protein crystallography, but it's being applied to many different other areas as well. Same solution. Well, once again, you can see the compute link up the top there um, as well. So we, we can send off stuff to a, a high performance computing and re ingest it, and we still have that metadata associated with it. You don't want to break that link. You want to make it easy for them to re ingest that data as easily as possible. And also, we, we, we um, send, register that data with our uh, national research data. Uh, repository ANS as well, so just the metadata, of course. And we also send it to a, uh, a particular portal um, called TARDIS, nothing to do with Doctor Who. Um, it's um, a long story. Um, and, and also, we can link it in with publications as well. Uh, so what's happening now at Monash, uh, in particular, is with all these groups of researchers, they're now getting, uh, getting discipline-specific solutions that are appearing. That's also helping them collaborate with their colleagues outside, because their colleagues also have similar solutions as well. And also for Monash, um, as I mentioned before, our approach isn't to have one generic solution for everyone. It's basically having a number of solutions. And it's really best of, pra uh, best of fit um, for whatever the researchers want. Um, some of you may in the audience may um, be familiar with Omero, the person from Dundee in the audience in particular, um, because um, what it is is it's a research data management solution to help with optical microscopy. And as part of one of the projects that we did for the Australian National Service, da Data Service, was to um, select a solution that was best to fit, Omero, and we basically uh, changed it so we could actually uh, share that data with our national repository. And uh, so that's worked quite well. But there's a number of different solutions, and each matching the particular researchers' needs in that space. When we talk about developing solutions at Monash, um, if those that are familiar with ITIL, which is a service management framework, they talk about service value as being uh, the utility plus the warranty. So utility is best of fit, uh, fit for practice, and warranty is more about the support side. But we take it further. We think about the adoption as well as the sustainability of it. Um, sustainability is a big thing, um, and I'll mention a bit more in the next couple of slides. I might jump through some of this stuff because I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, two minutes? Two. Okay, so fit for purpose. These are the sorts of things that, that we sort of think about uh, at Monash when we're trying to select a partic uh, develop a particular solution. Um, we don't, uh, many groups um, work in such a way where they actually push the technical aspect of the solution. We don't. We actually engage with the researcher and actually um, put them in front, actually put them in the lead. If they don't want to play that role, we don't develop the solution for them. And it's simple because we don't develop infrastructure for the sake of developing infrastructure. If they're not engaged with it at the start, how can you expect them to be engaged with it at the end of the, the um, development cycle? So we very much practice a solution called, uh, a particular way of developing software called Agile, or in particular Scrum. It's been very effective. All of that uh, psyche that I gave about the researcher before, it's the best sort of match for it. Um, 
and as I said, this is very different for many ways that IT groups in that work around the world. There's some learnings there. Um, I don't have time, but um, if, for those that want to see the slides or talk to me later, I can tell you how we've actually customised Scrum so it actually it really fits well into the research, uh, working with researchers. You know, really, we want to work with, re with the researchers as a team, not as a a adversaries. Conventional practices in that tend to be make it more adversarial. Also, when you develop stuff, you want to do it in an iterative approach. Scrum does that, so it's very important from that perspective. Talking about good adoption and that, um, you know, once again, if you, you develop something, you want it to be seen and used by the end of it. But the most important part of this particular slide is that when you develop it, you develop it for the community and they actually take the lead in it. You as an institution don't want to own the solution. Otherwise, you'll get to the end of the development and they'll be looking at you to get funding to take it further. Talking about sustainability, uh, and that also crosses over here, you think about if we have all these solutions, how do we sustain them? And it's easy to see if the community owns a solution and they want to see it progress, they'll actually find the funding for it. And then they'll come back and ask you as, a, an, a, as a, an IT capability to actually take it further. And we've already seen this happen at Monash with some of our ANS projects. We started off in that particular approach. We thought about sustainability from the start and we made sure that the researcher was leading the solution. We engaged with the community as well. The other thing is communicating the solution to um, getting it out there. For now, many of my colleagues in Australia were actually going to e-research uh, conferences and that and trying to sprout that. That's not the best way to actually communicate these solutions. The best place to communicate it is in the research community's own space. Talk about it at their conferences and that. Um, help them understand it and that. And also support their, the researchers in actually explaining it to their community. What those research communities will do is they'll talk to their own institutions. I'll say, look, I'm after this particular solution for, for, the, for us here at, at our institution. And then they'll actually you know, put the pressure on them to go and uh, adopt these particular solutions. So that's our sustainability model, and we've found it's been very effective to, to date and, and gotten some really good encouraging feedback from it. Um, so s promoting that sense of ownership is very important. Uh, supporting your research services, as I mentioned before, it, IT and research is very different. So you have to come in with a very much a different psyche. They're, they're looking for many different solutions, etc. Um, how do you go about supporting them? How do you sort of... Um, you know, instead of going from that enterprise approach to actually, you know, supporting something different. Many different, uh, so CIOs and, and IT directors at, at, at universities don't quite get it, or many of them don't quite get it yet. But then, now some of them are actually seeing that there is that difference between supporting an admin system and supporting a research system. And so um, they have to have a different approach. The approach that's happening now in Australia is we're actually having a separate a support group that specialises in providing e-research support. Same for research data management. So that's part of what they do. They're good at uh, engaging with solutions that may not be, you know, have a service level agreement associated with it. They know how to support it. They know how to work with the researchers because the researchers are different, etc. And sometimes, as I said, the solution may not be needed for a very long period of time. Also, traditional IT groups, when they support a solution, if you want to change it, it's a big, it's a big hoo-ha and it takes a while to do it. Um, our support group can quickly turn that around, so that's another important aspect. So just a summary of things that I, I've sort of mentioned before, that um, as institutions we need to engage with various research data management platforms, not just one. Um, we need to be able to think about it, adopting a solution first. If not, then maybe adapt a solution, and as a last resort, go and develop a solution. Institutions have to be flexible in the way that they actually deploy this particular infrastructure, because there's various aspects of it um, that will actually um, change that. And, uh, also that as institutions we need to consider about making certain bits of information available, in particular information about our researchers and that for these systems, Natasha mentioned it before, and uh, also the grants. And uh, also when in developing research infrastructure, think about the um, uh, sustainability of it as well as the adoption as well, not just the, the, the fit for, for, uh, best fit for practice. And uh, also consider having a, a separate uh, group to support e-research infrastructure or research data management infrastructure at your institutions. And finally, acknowledgements. Um, Paul Bonington, who's my director. David Saint, who's from Monash as well. Simon Yu, who's the lead developer. Steve Andrelakis, who some of you may also be familiar with, is da uh, our data consultant. And Richard Northam, who's uh, the CEO of our quarter group. And that's the Council of Australian uh, Directors of IT. Thank you very much.
thanks very much, Anthony. Um, it was very interesting. Um, in particular, the sort of the decision making process towards developing um, RDM um, platforms and solutions. Um, we have time for um, a couple of quick questions. Simon Hodson, just managing research data project. Thanks very much, Anton. That was a really rich presentation, an awful lot in there. I've got thousands of questions. Um, just one in particular. So you said Monash doesn't have a specific research data repository that's exposing research data as such, but you are sort of plugged into specific disciplinary instances or federated repositories like TARDIS. Um, in your engagement with researchers, have you not found research areas where there aren't disciplinary solutions of that sort and where there is a demand, therefore, for an institutional research data repository to expose research data? So, so our thoughts about it are that uh, a lot of that data we make available to a national repository, and the national repository is more comprehensive than the institutional one. Why would they go to something less comprehensive? Wouldn't they go to a national one? That's got more information, richer information than we can actually provide at our own institution. Sure, I, I follow that logic and that's what you said, but are, are there not gaps in that national provision? And when you say that national provision, do you mean Research Data Australia as the that's metadata right. store? Exactly. But that's, as I understand it, but correct, perhaps I don't understand fully, that's not storing the data as such, it's a pointer, a metadata pointer. Oh, yeah. But so with our platforms, they basically host the data and they actually disseminate it to many different places. And I mentioned before, they, dis they can disseminate it to uh, Research Data Australia, and uh, they can also disseminate it to their own community portal, and they can disseminate it to publications. Right. So it's, it's richly connected. It's not just thinking of one or the other, it's many. So just for clarity then, perhaps I misunderstood, you are storing the data, yep. but you're simply exposing the metadata elsewhere. That's right. Okay. The, we, we, some groups talk about having data and then shipping it somewhere else. Well, there's a lot of data. Some of our data sets are like 90 gigabytes. Who's going to keep all that data in some vault and how do you select what to keep and all that? Our researchers don't really want to you know, choose what to keep and what to get rid of. And they also don't want to choose what to archive necessarily and what not to archive. So um, those, and, and at Monash, they don't have to worry about that at the moment. We have time for one last question. I have a very, very quick question, Anthony, and it could be answered very quickly. Um, you mentioned that Monash has a, a, has a policy uh, for keeping primary data, uh, a, prim a copy of, of primary data. Um, at what granularity? Is that, is that um, data associated with publication? Or you know, the, the, the data behind the graph? Or I think, well, at the moment, it's uh, pretty much all data. They yeah. don't uh, discriminate. And, uh, but we've, we found that to many institutions, they sort of have to choose what to keep and what not to keep. And at uh, Monash, we've got a petabyte data store, and for the researchers that are currently engaged with it, we don't have to consider about those particular issues. Mm. So at the moment, it's not an issue for us. Um, but when, with that policy, it talks about it uh, as uh, it doesn't actually specify what it is. Yeah, yeah. So we're just thinking about it as all data. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Anthony. Um, we are um, breaking for lunch now at um, TV at House um, and just like to sort of thank all the speakers once again.